Good afternoon, everyone. We'll start off with my tie. Uh, the Fighting Muskies, Muskingum University. Um, where my cousin Nick graduated from, and of course, John and Annie Glenn graduated from. So give a shout out to the, the Fighting Muskies. We're gonna open uh, for the little good news here. You know, Fran and I have talked about what we'll remember from this coronavirus, but more importantly, what our kids and grandkids will remember uh, from it. Uh, today, I want to share a video with you from Miss Lewis's kindergarten class at Willowville Elementary in Batavia, down in Batavia. They want to share with you some of the things that they have been learning uh, during this time. Eric? Hi. We are in kindergarten during the 2019-2020 school year in Mrs. Lewis's class. That was great. Imagine uh, their 50th class reunion, they can show that. So it's, that's a really uh, a, a neat, neat thing to have. Um, today finishes up the election, and uh, we want to have Secretary of State Frank LaRose to kind of give us an update. We'll see if Frank is on. Frank is there. Hello, Frank. Hey, Governor. How's it going? <laughs> Looks like you're in the in the war room there. We are. We're here at the operations room at the Ohio Secretary of State's office. Of course, today is the culmination of Ohio's primary. We're looking forward to bringing this in for a landing. This is not what any of us had envisioned months ago for how we wanted to run this election. But I tell you what, we've risen to the occasion. Ohio's boards of elections, these bipartisan teams of very dedicated and patriotic individuals at all 88 counties, have risen to the occasion. And tonight at 7.30, we're going to close the polls. We're going to tabulate the results. And when Ohioans hear those results, they'll know that it was the voice, the true reflection of the will of the people of Ohio. That's why we, we run elections. Um, and that's something we believe in. As you know, this is personal for me. I've had the chance to see people risk their lives to cast ballots. I tell the story about seeing people in Iraq when I served there uh, who came out despite the threats of terrorists. They were told that they would have their fingers cut off if they had purple ink on them indicating that they had cast a ballot and they still had a 70 percent voter turnout and so that will uh that human desire to make your voice heard to have a, a participatory role in your in your government is a strong one and ohioans are exhibiting that we've uh we've seen over 1.9 million requests for absentee ballots that's great news 1.5 million have been returned we know that many more are being returned as we speak we just heard from the u.s postal service that uh, they're delivering 17,000 ballot envelopes to the Cuyahoga County Board of Elections. Hamilton County is gonna be receiving 10,000. We're hearing numbers like that all over the state, and we're hearing that people are lining up in their cars 
uh, to come and drop their ballots off at the secure drop box at each county board of elections. Again, all 88 counties have a secure drop box available so that Ohioans that have waited, that still have their ballot, if your ballot's sitting there on your kitchen table, we want to hear your voice. We don't want you left out of this election. You have until 7.30 tonight to get that ballot submitted. you got to get it to your county board of elections. But at 7.31, the window closes. Those boxes are going to be emptied, and the tabulation is going to be done, and we're going to report those results tonight. Something else that's important to mention, uh, not only the work of those uh, thousands of really hardworking, dedicated elections professionals, but really uh, this has been a, a big lift and a big undertaking. Listen, Ohioans of all different types uh, have risen to the occasion. We had grocery stores that were putting out absentee ballot requests. We had food banks around Ohio that were distributing absentee ballot requests. We even had a guy in, uh, in Wayne County that figured out that if he uh, tied a bag to the bottom of his remote controlled drone that he could fly it to his neighbor's house and deliver some absentee ballot requests to them. Ohioans rise to the occasion and that's exactly what we've done. Again, uh, this election looks different. Life looks different. Um, life has changed dramatically in the last few weeks. One thing that will never change, the bedrock principle, is that every voice matters and every vote counts. And that's the spirit that we've taken in this election. We look forward to getting it concluded tonight and moving on to making sure that we're prepared for November. Uh, thank you for your leadership, Governor. Thank you, Lieutenant Governor Husted. It's great to have a Lieutenant Governor who himself served as a Secretary of State. He's been a great partner in this endeavor. Uh, and my, my, my message to Ohioans is get your absentee ballot submitted, if you still have it, down to your county board of elections. You can get the address for your county board of elections at voteohio.gov. That's the trusted source of information for that address to get down there and submit your absentee ballot in the secure drop box before 730 tonight. Frank, let me, Thanks, Governor. Let, let me thank you very, very much. Let me just ask a question um, for, for clarification for everyone. The, the drop box uh, at the Board of Elections, is that a, is that a drive-by? Can you drive by, and, and how does that work? Do you have to go in, or how does that work? Well, we want to minimize the number of people going into Boards of Elections. Of course, as a result of the law that the state legislature passed, we created a special circumstance and uh, limited in-person voting for today, and that's just for Ohioans who are homeless or disabled, who can't vote by mail, or for that rare circumstance where somebody requested their ballot by the Saturday deadline, but hasn't received it yet. Uh, for those individuals, they'll be going inside. For everyone else, yeah, it's it's come to the drop box. Most of them are a drive up. Uh, some of them may be up by the front door of the Board of Elections. You just park briefly, you walk up there, you, you put your ballot in the drop box, they'll be counted, and you'll hear uh, your voice will be heard when we tabulate the results tonight. Many of them are drive up, some you may have to walk a short distance to. And they can do that, Frank, between right now and 7.30 tonight. Right now and until 7.30 tonight, and we're hearing that a lot of people are. We've had counties where there's a sheriff's deputy out there directing traffic because there's so many cars coming in the parking lot to drop off ballots. That's a good thing. We can do this in a socially distanced way, uh, in a way where you can submit your ballot and, and still be safe and sound. And, Governor, that's been our goal from the beginning uh, during this public health emergency. We didn't want to ask Ohioans to choose between their fundamental rights and their health. And thankfully, hasn't been the perfect process, but Ohio has run a smooth and a fair election where you can cast your ballot without jeopardizing your health. That's the goal. That's what we're doing here in the Buckeye State. And thank you for your leadership, Governor, on that. Frank, thank you very much. Good luck tonight. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Frank LaRose, Secretary of State. From the very beginning of our battle against this virus, uh, we have all been in this truly together. Uh, as governor, it is my responsibility to make some of the tough decisions. But it's also my responsibility to listen, uh, to hear, and to be respectful of the thoughts uh, and ideas of my fellow Ohioans. There is a wise old saying, and I'll quote, none of us is as smart as all of us, end of quote. And so as we continue this journey together uh, to battle this shared enemy that, that we face, that I talk about every day, um, my commitment to you is that I will continue to listen. Uh, continue to listen to your thoughts, continue to listen to your ideas uh, as we move through this process. Um, listen to you uh, as we try to work our way through this. 
there will certainly have to be and have been adjustments as we go. Within the last 24 hours, uh, it's really become clear to me that a mandatory mask requirement, a mandatory mask requirement for people who are shopping, uh, going into a retail uh, business, uh, is offensive uh, to some of our fellow Ohioans. And I, I understand that. We've also, I've also heard that for some people, it, this is a difficult thing to do. Um, and I got a call last night uh, from a mom who I did not know. Um, and we had a, a great conversation. I listened to her. And she talked about her son, who is autistic. And she explained to me um, how he saw things, how he felt things, and that that presented a real problem uh, for him. So I get it. I, I, I understand. And so we made a decision that for retail customers, this is not going to be mandated. Government's not going to mandate that. Um, it is best practices. And I want to spend a little time uh, maybe talking about that. Um, but again, to emphasize, I've heard you, and uh, we're not going to mandate this. We're going to leave it up to the individual customer. But it is going to be, for most people, uh, for those who can do it, uh, a, a recommendation. In fact, a strong recommendation that individuals do this. And let me talk a little bit about why we did this. First, it was a recommendation uh, from, our, from our business group. But I have to tell you that in the last few weeks, uh, as some retail has been open, uh, grocery stores, for example, I've heard from a lot of my fellow Ohioans, and their concern has been about a loved one who worked at the grocery store or maybe at the drugstore or some other business that was, that was still open. And their concern was for that person's health. And I even heard from some people who themselves were, were working in, in a retail establishment and were worried about uh, the COVID-19 virus and getting it. Um, this is a particular concern when we know the fact that, for some people at least, uh, they can be carrying this virus a customer can be coming in carrying this virus, and the customer has no idea that they have it, uh, not showing symptoms in any way. And, and again, we worry uh, about that person, of course, but we worry about the people who are working in the store as well. So it was for the protection of these employees, the people who are serving us every single day, that we made this decision uh, that that original order uh, was issued. And although it's not a mandate now, it is clearly in the best interest of Ohioans uh, to wear a mask in retail. It uh, gives added protection to others. And when you wear a mask, you're protecting those around you from possibly getting sick. Dr. Acton and others uh, have explained that the wearing of the mask is not really so much to protect you but is to protect others. And then, of course, if everybody's wearing the mask, then everyone is, in fact, uh, protected. Um, I've already stated this, but when I go out in public, uh, if I go into a store, uh, you know, I will wear this mask or one of the ones uh, Fran has made. Uh, but again, it doesn't have to be one that has been made. It can be something that literally any, any kind of facial facial covering. I've recommended to the members of my family, um, ask them to do the same thing because I think it is, it, it is at least in most cases, the best, best practice. Um, I want to talk a little bit about the fact that throughout this, it's really been your individual actions that have truly made the difference. Um, it's how we flatten the curve. We've accomplished a lot of different things. And it's been really your actions, your actions, things you've not done, uh, that have gotten us where we are today. And your 
individual actions collectively are so much more important uh, than any order I issue or Dr. Acton, state government in any way issues. And so as we, as we go forward into this new chapter where we're trying to get back and we're trying to get back in business and get people back with their jobs, um, it's not only equally important, but it's more important what you do uh, and how careful you are during this period of time. Let me just conclude by saying it's, it's really been your decisions, uh, your decisions that have truly made the big, big difference. Um, my wife, Fran, tells me always to trust Ohioans. Um, and we, we certainly have done this as we move forward. Uh, she told me the other day, she said, you know, you need to trust Ohioans. Um, you've trusted them going in uh, as these orders were made, these sometimes suggestions were made, and Ohioans did amazingly well. Uh, she said, it's important to trust them as you're going out and as we are moving forward, as we're getting back back into business. Uh, and so we are in this together. Uh, we're going to keep fighting together, and we can make it. We can do two things at once. Uh, we can come back, we can start business back up, and we can stay safe at the same time. I want to talk for a moment uh, about a group of citizens that I continue to be concerned, particularly concerned about, and that is those who have a, a health problem, those who are over 65. I got a call this morning from a, a friend of mine in Cleveland, and he talked to me and he said, I want to tell you a story about a mutual friend of ours. And the mutual friend is certainly o over 65, um, and he said, you know, I got a call from her, and she told me, you know, boy, I'm anxious to get out. The governor has changed the orders, and I can go out and, and do all these things. And, and my friend who was making the call to me said, you know, I told her, you know, you're not, because of your age, because of your health, uh, you need to be really, really careful. I, I looked at uh, every morning, I look at all the newspapers, uh, the, the headlines of the newspapers, the major newspapers across the state of Ohio. And it's just always instructive to see how, what those headlines are. And I looked at the headlines and this, to this morning, and it was not what, unexpected. But the emphasis was on re reopening. And that's good. We want people to be looking forward to the future. Um, but also, as people looked at that, um, my concern is that that's what they would see and only see that uh, and not understand that, again, this is going to come back to individual decisions, and each person is going to have to make, take in their own hands their, their future. Uh, and for some people, that may be going out, uh, maybe going to a store they've been waiting to visit for some time, um, and that's great. But for other people, if they assess their situation, um, they may say, I'm staying here um, because it's really a high, high risk. So again, it comes back to each one of us uh, assessing uh, what really uh, the situation is for us and what the situation is uh, out, out there. Uh, Dr. Acton uh, and I and John have been trying every week, every day, uh, to give you the best information that we had available at the time. And we're going to continue to do that uh, so everyone can be informed about the decisions uh, that they are making. Let me uh, turn to the Lieutenant Governor. Uh, well, let me, let, me fit, let, me, let me make one more, one more announcement, which I almost forgot, John. Excuse me. I was hoping you were going to. Yes, I got one more. I forgot <laughs> almost, almost. Um, you know, throughout my time as, as governor and before that uh, for eight years as the Attorney General of Ohio, one of the things I found is really helpful and really beneficial 
uh, and got the job done was if we had a problem, uh, if we had something that needed to be looked at, I put a citizens group, a group of my fellow Ohio citizens, uh, together to look at the problem and to come back with, with recommendations. Um, I, I've always told my team that, uh, you know, there's always Ohioans, whatever problem we have, there's some Ohioans out there who know more than we do about this particular area, and we need to gather them together um, and get, get some results. Um, the group that Frank Sullivan, that we asked Frank Sullivan to put together, uh, the business group, uh, has done that. And some of the, the announcements that we made yesterday came as a re direct result of that. Um, we did the same thing in putting a working group together on medical decisions and, and health issues uh, and continue to rely on, on, on that, that group. Um, so I've reached out um, to members of the General Assembly and I've also reached out to, to others um, to put a couple groups together. Uh, and one is a group to look at uh, restaurants and how we reopen restaurants, what the safety precautions we're going to have to have in place, uh, and the other is barbershops and, and salons. Um, and so these will be two separate groups. Um, so this is something that I think uh, tr truly can make a difference. Uh, I've reached out to Speaker Householder, uh, to Senate President Obhoff, House Minority Leader Sykes, and Senate Min Minority Leader Yuko. Uh, we've reached out to them to help identify people who work in these fields every day. Ohioans who may not be part of uh, a, a bigger chain of, of businesses, for example, they may have their own barbershop, they may have their own salon, they may have their neighborhood restaurant, uh, because we want to hear from them uh, as well as uh, the other people who, who are involved in, in, in the chains. Um, so the legislative leaders uh, and these also the relevant business associations uh, are going to reach out to their members. Uh, and the legislature, uh, they're going to reach out to their, their members uh, and f ask their members to identify people and their districts who might be part of this group. Um, they will be meeting virtually. They'll be meeting on the phone. Uh, obviously, they won't be meeting in person. Uh, but we intend to pull these groups together this week, start some discussions, look at best practices. We'll have some health people involved in that as well uh, and come up with some recommendations as we look to the future um, in regard to our next steps uh, in, in this area. Lieutenant Governor. Thank you, Governor. Uh, Good afternoon. Uh, really, all I want to do is, is sort of add a little bit to that and, and say that the business group that we put together that helped help uh, us craft the announcement yesterday was very valuable because they talked to uh, a, a vast variety of, of different types of businesses who operate in those different spaces and could could give us guidance. And, and uh, the barbers and the cosmetology um, uh, businesses, uh, personal care services, the restaurants, and, and et cetera. What we want to do is we want to hear from everybody all across the state, uh, different types, because one restaurant's not like a, a, another. Some are small operations, some are large operations, some have different types of clientele. Uh, and working with the health officials, we want to make sure that when that day comes and the health data and other factors that go into these decisions that say that, that we want to move forward with this next phase, that we're ready to go, that we don't have to think about what this should look like, that we have heard the voices, that we have buy-in on it, and, and we're ready uh, to proceed when, when that time comes. And so these voices are very helpful to us. When we left here yesterday, I, uh, when we, we walked out, I said to the governor, I said, well, we, we, we got this done, and now I know we're going to have to go back to work at looking at all the other things that have been left unaddressed. And I'm not going to go through all those <laughs> because, believe me, we hear you. We hear the things that are on your mind, uh, and, and we begin immediately trying to figure out what the future of the things that uh, are still not allowed to happen in our, in our society, in our lives, in our economies, uh, where those things are, how we can think about doing them uh, thoughtfully and more safely in the future, and, and to, to prepare for that future 
when life begins to turn to, to continue to, to to resemble what we once know at least a little bit more a little gradually as we work through this uh, and and so we're we just want you to know that we're we're preparing for this that we're hard at work on it our work doesn't stop uh, but as is always important to remind the the more we follow the protocols whether it's the distancing the disinfecting the mask the things like that the more we slow the spread uh, the more we maintain a healthy environment and then sooner the next phases come so this all works together uh, it works together and, and thanks to you it's worked together uh, very well ohio is in, in a lot better shape than, than a lot of other states uh, who are of our size and uh, we appreciate all the great work and all the great input that we receive from folks and remember as you see this I get because I get a lot of these questions from folks well does my business does my operation comply with the new rules okay well as those are as those are um, released to you remember it's the same thing as we've always said that you need to read them you need to understand how they apply to you uh, you need to develop a plan to comply with them and then you need to be able to justify them uh, if you open up, because if you can comply, you can open. If you can't comply, you can't open. And as you open up, be prepared that if, if an employee or a competitor or a customer says you're not following the rules, then they're likely to, to maybe give the health department a call, and, and then you would have to justify them. So this is the same process we had in the past. We have a dispute resolution commission that can handle things when there are different opinions in different counties, but it's the same uh, the same process as we've had in the past, uh, and that worked well. Ohioans, Ohio businesses were very compliant. They worked, they worked through these things. They thought through how to keep their employees and their customers safe, and they move forward, and that's exactly what we expect will happen. But we are, you know, not, uh, we're, we're not going to be done trying to figure out every aspect of this until we're done until we're through this, and so know that your voices are being heard, and this is just another announcement today, another step on how we're gonna prepare ourselves for the next phases of this. Governor? Thanks, John. Dr. Acton. Thank you, Governor. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, I think we'll take a little bit, look at the data today. Uh, so right now in Ohio, we have 16,769 cases. So that is up by about 444 um, that we've learned about since yesterday. Um, and, uh, and our um, deaths are now at 799. That increased 46 that we've learned about since yesterday. What is um, notable here is we are now at 88 counties. We have uh, three cases in the last county, which is Vinton County. So we are now seeing cases. Next slide. Um, thanks, Eric. Um, in all counties. Uh, we still have that age range, uh, less than 1 to 106. And we are continuing to skew slightly more male than female. Um, we do know that 6% of all of our cases have required um, ICU admission. And 16% of our cases are healthcare workers. Again, this is who we're testing at this point, um, people who are more sick. So uh, next slide. And so our trends um, over five days, again, we're still very, very level overall. Um, we, we definitely like to look at trends over time. Um, and we see our cases are really about flat overall. Um, a little bit up just with the deaths that were reported. Um, and we know, again, we shouldn't always be surprised by some changes. We know, Governor, that um, being sick follows getting infected and deaths are following. So um, I wouldn't be surprised to see that. Hospitalizations um, uh, slightly up over the five-day average at 108. Um, and then ICU admissions, um, 26. So those are our numbers today. I do want to note that um, some of the symptoms that the CDC has changed in their definition of symptoms. They've added to the usual things that we had all been looking for in COVID were cough, um, fever, shortness of breath. But we're now seeing um, new symptoms being listed. So there are a lot of folks who get COVID that don't actually have a fever 
or maybe have a fever much later in the onset of their illness. Um, chills and shaking, even without a uh, fever, has been a symptom. Um, muscle pain, headache, sore throat, and you've probably been hearing about the loss of taste and smell. So those actual symptoms have now um, been added to, to the list of symptoms by the CDC. I do want to highlight the at-risk groups that the governor mentioned, um, heart conditions, lung conditions, hypertension, uh, diabetes, liver and kidney disease. Um, if you've had any kind of immunocompromised or you're on cancer treatment, that can be a risk. Obesity is a risk. Um, and that puts over half of Ohioans might have at least one of those, those risks. Um, another thing I'd like to point out are a couple things around well care. Uh, tomorrow and going forward, the governor is going to be talking about the same sort of layered approach to our health care sector. But I want to point out a couple things all along. Um, Help Me Grow program has been open and remains open. That is our well uh, child checks for our home visiting. So I do want people to know that they're doing it in new ways. It's important to get that advice around feeding and sleeping and taking care of a baby and having better birth outcomes. Um, but they're using video. Uh, they're doing it over the phone. There's some creative ways. So if you have interest, again, Help Me Grow is our home visiting program here in Ohio. And you can go to coronavirus.ohio.gov to learn more. Um, I also want to note that it might be a good time for parents to make those well child appointments. You know, we have postponed um, some things that we'll be adding in, some of those low risk things like getting mammograms or getting well kinds of procedures that don't really require a lot of PPE or you can be very careful about that. So I really think, you know, some, there have been some articles about, you know, how we've missed immunizations and we know it's really important um, to make sure we're preventing against the diseases that we can prevent against. So definitely think about contacting your primary care provider, your pediatrician, um, to make those appointments. Uh, they'll be doing some unique things going forward. Uh, there are some looks at uh, morning visits, waiting in your car to get those shots, um, even house calls. So you might want to talk to your doctor about that. Another point, uh, another area of public health is around water quality and safety. So I've been asked to remind people if they are starting to use a building um, or, or some place where you haven't been for a while, it's really important to flush your cold and hot water. This is a partnership um, with the Ohio EPA and the Ohio Department of Health. We know that lead can build up in water pipes that have not been used, as well as diseases like Legionella. So we have advice on our website about how to make sure your building is safe if you haven't been using the water. Another thing uh, that Dr. Weir had mentioned last week is about air circulation. We have seen some studies that talk about coronavirus in the air and some very simple things you can do, like making sure with your spring, as we should be doing with our furnaces, to change the filter, add a very thick filter. Another thing he had mentioned to us on a call we were on was um, the air circulation in your house. Of course, getting those windows open is always a good idea in the spring. But also, another thing you can do is make sure that you're not reusing your air, either in your house or in your business. Um, you can talk to your heating and cooling person about that, but sometimes if you put it on to recirculate, and that's a way to kind of keep our energy bills lower. But what we really want to be doing now with coronavirus is actually drawing in more outside air. So maybe taking the setting and making sure that you're um, not just recycling air in your house or maybe even in your car, but that you're getting that fresh air in. So those are all good tips moving forward. One last thing I, I'd really like to talk about. Um, first of all, um, it's really important to know that our hospitals are very safe places to be right now. I think people are scared. You know, hospitals have very strict guidelines of infection control going on. And when they are taking care of coronavirus patients, that's often being done in a special area in the hospital. But I know that people have been a little bit afraid to go to the hospital just for routine things or go to the ER. And I just really don't want anyone getting sick from something else or, God forbid, dying from something that they could have gone to the hospital for. So please know that there are really great infection, probably better than ever, infection control going on in a lot of places from nursing homes to hospitals. Um, but I want to talk about the providers for a second. Um, I read a very sad story today 
um, about an ER doc in New York City. Um, she had been in the thick of things, um, treating coronavirus patients nonstop, and unfortunately took her own life. Uh, she wasn't someone who had struggled uh, with depression or anything, at least in, in the story from her family. But, you know, for healthcare workers out there, you're, you know, all of us aren't seeing what you're seeing. And sometimes as we move on and you see us trying to sort of bring our life back, I know that there are many of you who are fighting the battle, you know, on the front lines every day, whether you're a first responder or a healthcare worker, or you're a nursing home worker, or you're one of the folks working in our prisons. And it can come up on you. I just want to say, you know, when I was young in my career, um, I started out in New York City in the Bronx. So it was the middle of the crack cocaine epidemic. And people were dying. It was a very, very rough time in New York, not unlike here, where I, you know, half of my kids were going to be dead by the age of three from contracting AIDS in utero. And there were just rooms full of babies with no parents and incubators with no parents. And day after day, I worked there, and I didn't notice, like, slowly, week by week, I lost weight. Before I knew it, I had lost 25 pounds. And I was starting to feel anxious. I didn't know I was feeling anxious because I would run up and down the stairs from, from the emergency room, and the more I ran, I'd get rid of that anxious feeling. But when I would sit still or I would go home at night, I found I couldn't sleep. And I started to have panic attacks, which is something I had never had in my life. I'd been through a lot as a kid. But I think seeing other people suffer and die, um, that I felt like I couldn't help them, um, that helpless feeling caused that for me. And I sought help. And I just really want to say to everyone out there, please seek help if you're struggling at all. Don't, don't be afraid to. It's nothing we need to be ashamed of. And we do have our text uh, for Hope line. It is 741-741. Uh, text, text, um, for hope, 741 741, and you're not alone, and just reach out. We are, we're not forgetting about you. As, as we talk about getting out and about, we're, we're still thinking about you. Thank you. All right, I see Mr. Adi is ready for the first question. Thanks for doing this. The senior this. member of the uh, press corps. Thank you, sir. You've stepped back and done a course correction on uh, the mask mandate. I wanted to see if you had figured out yet what to do about child care. I asked the question on behalf of Monica of New Carlisle, Ohio, who's telling us she's got to have good access to quality child care before people go back to work, her and many other people, not after they're supposed to go back to work. What can you do for her and everybody else? Well, Jim, it certainly is, is, is a big question. We fully understand that there are people who um, want to go back to work and, you know, they need the, they need the child care. Uh, as I pointed out yesterday, uh, it is a particular challenge uh, for, for a couple reasons. But one reason uh, is that, you know, we, we closed down the schools and the child care not so much because we were concerned about those children. Uh, what we found with this virus um, is that it is not that tough on kids. Uh, you still want to be careful, but, uh, but the real, real concern is uh, when you have a group of children, whether they're in kindergarten or whether they're in, in, in child care, um, they, one, one of those children goes into that setting and if they are carrying the virus, uh, then it's no time until maybe all those kids have it. And, of course, then those kids are going back to their respective homes. So the same principle in regard to schools also applies to child care. And that's why trying to figure out how we can do this in a way that helps people get back to work. Uh, what, to go back, what we did as, as we closed down child care, we did allow child care to take place uh, in regard to our first responders, our, our, our medical community, so that they could be sure to continue to work. And what we did there is we dramatically changed the size of the, of the class, and so we, we cut that down significantly. Now, obviously, uh, you have costs that go with that. Um, and so I was talking, uh, in fact, about an hour ago to, to the Speaker, Senate President, 
uh, about kind of how we start back in regard to child care. So that's a long answer to say we understand it's important. Uh, we got to get it right. Uh, we're going to do it, but it's a work in progress, and we're not quite ready to get to get this done. You lifted the uh, mandate on customers when it comes to uh, face masks in stores. Does the employer still have the right to turn customers away if they arrive and aren't wearing masks? And secondly, whose cost, whose responsibility is it to supply masks to the employees? Is it the employer's responsibility? Uh, the answer is in the employer in both, in both cases. Uh, the, the employer uh, can make a decision uh, as the employer, it's their business, uh, that they're re re going to require uh, everybody that comes in the door uh, to have a mask on. In fact, you know, there are companies now uh, that have continued to work throughout this process that, that have that uh, in place, is my understanding. Uh, and again, this, the recommendation came, came from the business group uh, who was looking at how do we get back to work, uh, how do we get, get people moving forward, but also to protect the employees? Uh, and so protecting employees is, is, is certainly very, very important. But to answer your question, yes, the business, the business group, uh, let's say it's a retail company, uh, you know, they can make a decision that um, everybody that comes in the door, uh, whether it be a salesperson or a delivery person or, or a customer, uh, that they need to wear, wear, wear a protective covering. John, you want to... Yeah, answer, the, answer, yeah, the only thing, you know... Add I, something about, excuse me. Yeah. Um, it, it's, it doesn't say mask, it says face covering, and lots of things can comply as long as it's going over your nose and your mouth. And this is what Dr. Acton, if you want to add some, this is what we want over... This my daughter made for me last night. <laughs> she got a new sewing machine. She's learning how to sew during uh, the, the break uh, uh, that she's on right now. And so, you know, there are a variety of ways you can comply with it. Uh, which is important. We will also be, and this is an important thing to know because I get a lot of questions from businesses, we will be developing a frequently asked question uh, document to give specific guidance on these kinds of things in the coming days, which we hope will clarify these, these things in the minds of businesses and the people who need to comply with it. Hello, Governor Ben Garbrick with ABC6 and Fox 28. One common question we keep getting from viewers is asking about graduation ceremonies. I understand large gatherings are not allowed still, but many people are wondering if social distancing was observed, if there was a smaller group, maybe inside of a football stadium where they're outdoors and they're not within six feet of one another, would it be possible to have graduation ceremonies with some of these precautions in place? I think, again, everything always comes back to distance. Everything always comes back to protecting people. And so, you know, whatever question we get asked, that really is kind of how we have to look at this. So if a, as far as I'm concerned, if a school um, can do the distancing, if they can figure out how to do that, um, you know, they can, they can certainly do graduation. They can do something, something else. Um, you know, so again, it's up to the school. Uh, some of this is going to be driven by how many students they have, obviously, in graduation. Um, it's going to be driven by what facility they have. So there's a lot of different things. But could there be a way that a school puts together a graduation? I would certainly think so. Um, again, they've got to be careful. It's got to be well thought out. And they've got to figure it out. Some schools, just because of uh, how many students they have in graduation class, probably can't do it very well or can't do it. Uh, but if they can do that, as far as I'm concerned, that's correct. Uh, that would be fine. Now, I think, I think the State uh, Department of Education did put out some guidance. I didn't see it going out, but, it, but I think it was consistent with uh, the things that we have been do saying uh, that talked about not having graduation. So that would have to be something that we get clarified through, through the Department of Education. But it just seems to me, uh, as a parent and grandparent who's been through a lot of graduations, uh, and I know how important they are, that if we could figure out a way, or if that school can figure out a way uh, to do it, um, 
that might might be an okay thing to do. Uh, good afternoon. It's Laura Bischoff, Dayton Daily News. My question is for Dr. Acton and, and Governor DeWine. Um, obviously, this pandemic is a harsh uh, reminder of the importance of vaccines. Should Ohio eliminate the catch-all in state law that allows parents to exempt their, um, you know, not have their kids vaccinated for reasons of conscience? You know, I, 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 I don't think we are ready to do that. Um, you know, what is concerning is that during this period of time, people have pulled back and they've also pulled back from getting vaccines and, and doing the, as Dr. Acton talked about, the basic health care, well baby clinic, checkup, et cetera. And that has included, uh, I'm sure, vaccines. And so, you know, vaccines are something that I, I understand that some people don't want to have their children do that. But from a medical point of view, the evidence is abundantly clear that it's important for society for that to take place. And it has to take place at a certain level, uh, really, to be able to protect everyone. So something we will watch, but, um, you know, I don't think that is something that we, that's not a bridge that we have to cross at this point. Dr. Acton, have anything to add? The level maybe of that's needed as far as vaccines and maybe some of the science uh, behind all of this. Well, Laura, as you know, I, I think vaccines are something um, that coronavirus is giving us a sense of appreci appreciation for um, how life-saving they are when you look at how many Americans we have lost. Um, I know there are many, many people wishing they would have had access, their family member would have had access to something like that. Um, you know, one of the hard things about vaccines and is that, you know, when we didn't have them, when you were a parent and you were afraid of your kid going out now in the springtime, um, you wouldn't let them go out to play because of polio. You were scared they could end up on an iron lung. And I think when, when we have something, and it's like so many things in public health, when you can prevent it and you don't see it, I, I think the fear of the risks, and as the governor always says, there's always slight risks and benefits to things. Uh, most vaccines are very, very safe. So, so I think vaccines are an important thing for children. Um, we still lose a lot of children to preventable diseases, like um, children still die from chickenpox, they still die from measles. So, um, you know, I certainly do encourage uh, families to talk to their doctor um, about what's right for them and, um, and, and get vaccinated. Dad, Laura, um, I, I'm, I'm old enough to remember that as a child, uh, my parents talking about the great fear they had of, of, of polio. And I remember them saying, well, we can't go to the ball game, or we can't do this. There's been an outbreak of, of, of polio. And so it really inhibited people's lives uh, and, and to such an extent that I think people really probably didn't understand until we've had this uh, coronavirus. Uh, but those of us old enough to remember the, the polio scares, literally, um, and the, the great fear that parents had about going places and you know you couldn't go here you couldn't go there couldn't go to the swimming pool couldn't do that um and so what th these vaccines have done uh, as we obviously are seeing th what we hope comes up with vaccine in regard to the coronavirus is they they basically free people to live their lives a and uh, i saw that with with, with polio um uh, you know i remember when we got literally uh, they got the first first shot, and uh, it was uh, it was you know you can't believe how happy people were uh, to think that they had a way to prevent polio, that their child would not risk that, uh, and that they could go about and live their lives without that knife hanging over their head all the time. Uh, just, just you know we haven't really seen anything like that uh, uh, until we had this. The coronavirus. Adrian Robbins, NBC4, and my question's for Dr. Acton. Um, people are going to be heading back to work soon, and 
now customers won't be mandated to wear a mask. How much risk is associated with caring for somebody if you're working at one of these stores without a mask? And how do we make sure that people continue to do these guidelines when they're losing the fear of the coronavirus that they maybe had before? Right, so you obviously could probably realize that, you know, my biggest fear is that um, people won't hear the subtlety in what the governor is saying about we need to respect the virus, like we need to respect um, this threat. And I think not mandating, which I, I, I support the fact that we are not mandating uh, wearing a face covering or a mask, but I strongly suggest we do uh, when we can. And, and, and again, the governor talks a lot about our choices um, and how what we do greatly puts those employees at risk. Um, and we might not know we're carrying the virus because we're asymptomatic, so we're feeling good. And again, you're talking to a person who doesn't love wearing something over my face, but I, I have to remind myself again and again, this is, this is for a period of time and if I can think about this person or the three other people removed that might get infected, you know, I, I, I can do this. I can don, don the mask, and don the cape just a little bit longer. And so I do think, I mean, we, you know, the business guidelines are, there are a lot of guidelines here and it is strongly recommending this. So I, I hope people weren't thinking that the governor was sort of saying, oh, I'm going the opposite way, that, that's not it. And um, the other thing I would say is, you know, offices are um, considered in this more low-risk category, but I strongly encourage that anyone in any business who can allow employees to still telecommute, that that would still be the first choice right now. You know, we're still flat and not really out of the woods yet, and so I think in any way, we're going to be talking a lot about healthier at home, safer at home. You know, I just want us to, like, use that judgment where we can and when we do have options to keep you know, most of the movement still down. It's really important right now, because this is, this, is this is a difficult time, and I, I, I just would hate to see us having to go backwards. If I could add a little bit to that from, from the, the conversations with the businesses that I've talked with, uh, and what the governor said, and understand this, just because it's not mandated does not mean it's not a best practice. And many businesses are doing this and will do this, because they want to, to attract employees and customers. I talked to one business owner in Northeast Ohio who said that his goal was to make his business the safest place to work and, and to, to serve customers in all of that part of the state. And so I think a lot of businesses, because they want to build trust with employees and customers, will do these things, but there's just a difference between a mandate from government that you do it and a <laughs> and a best practice, and I think many businesses will go above and beyond this to, to create a great environment for their employees and for their customers. One of the, one of the challenges that we've heard from business, um, and John alluded to that, is businesses that have told us, look, we have a hard time getting people to work because they're afraid. And, and so businesses that want to protect their employers or employees you know, this is going to be one of the reasons that they will, will be doing this. Um, it, it is, it is, you know, the distancing itself, as Dr. Acton says, this is like Swiss cheese. Uh, the distancing is very important, but you layer on top of that both parties having a mask, uh, both parties having some facial covering, and you've added another layer of, uh, of protection. And, uh, you know, this came about because of my concern and others' concerns about employees, the people who every day get up, go to work, uh, particularly if they're in a retail business, they're coming in contact with a lot of different people, and they, f they feel that risk, and it is, a, it is a, a risk, but it's a risk that can be mitigated and can be dramatically reduced uh, if a lot of different things occur. Uh, and having people who are wearing masks, wearing, wearing that facial covering, is one of the ways to rather dramatically reduce, reduce that risk. One of the ways.
Windsor, WMFD TV, Mansfield. My question is for Governor DeWine. Governor, good to see you again today, sir. Uh, our viewers are asking where they can find data to support the continuation of the emergency orders. Uh, they're telling us that they can't find the information discrediting that the, cat, the, the curve is flat and that capacity is full. We're also being told that requests for information are being stalled due to a provision in House Bill 197. So can you tell our viewers where to go to read up on the data that's driving the order's continuation as well as yesterday's plan? And I just want to check in on our request for contracts between the state and Thermo Fisher, Road Dental, Partners in Health, and OSU Wexner Medical Center. We're happy to give you those contracts. Uh, I'm not even sure all of them have been actually signed. Uh, but we have a, a certainly understanding, I think, uh, maybe some of them have been signed. I think one of them may not be, but we'll certainly get those out. Those are public information, and we're, we're happy to uh, supply that. As far as the data, um, we're producing more data uh, than's ever been produced uh, in the history of the state of Ohio, and certainly more than the health department has ever put out. Uh, I'm going to let Dr. Acton, um, you know, specifically answer your question. But our goal all along has been to put out the information. Um, you know, we have given out all the data uh, that we had, make that available. And what we have seen, big, big picture, is that we have certainly uh, taken that curve down. It was going like that. It's now like, like that. Uh, we're looking at data every day. Uh, anybody can tune in at 2 o'clock and, and see a lot of the data, uh, or they can go on onto the web page. But I'm going to let Dr. Acton uh, answer the rest of the question Absolutely. about what shows, um, you know, the justification for us still to be concerned. But I, I would just add one different, one more thing. Uh, every day, every day, every morning, I look at the numbers. And I see more Ohioans who are dying from COVID-19. And I see more Ohioans who are going into the hospital and more Ohioans who are going into ICU. So anybody who thinks that this is some sort of conspiracy or this is uh, need to talk to some of the members, the families of those who have died. Uh, this is killing people every day in Ohio. Ohioans have done great. We fought back, and we're going to fight back more with the testing that we have, and we're going to fight back more um, with the tracing that we're going to do. But anybody that thinks that this is some sort of hoax or this is not occurring, um, you know, has not talked to some of the family members who, who have lost someone uh, or the family members who have not been able to go visit their relative because because it's COVID-19 and, and, and their husband or their wife and they've died without anybody being there with them. So this is, this is nasty stuff. And, and I think any time that we, we act like it's some conspiracy uh, or somebody's making this stuff up, uh, that is not really doing a, a service to the people uh, of the state of Ohio. Dr. Acton. Thank you, Governor. Yeah, so we do have data on our website, coronavirus.ohio.gov. There's also Ohio data on a bunch of different, um, in the news, a lot of the newspapers are doing investigative reporting and they're, they're doing the data, um, as well as at the CDC. So Ohio Department of Health is like a small version of the CDC. Uh, we have lots of metrics and actually uh, more and more metrics that we'll be following all the time, especially when we have more testing. We'll be able to follow prevalence numbers. Um, we'll be able to look at rates of infection. Um, we're checked, we're gonna uh, keep track of how much contact tracing is going on, how much testing we're doing. We'll be looking again still at the old oldies but goodies like the ones I, I just showed around hospitalizations and not just new hospitalizations each day, but how many people are actually hospitalized, um, which is a number that's going up currently. We will follow deaths, and we know that many, much of this data is going to lag. Um, even deaths, we know, are underestimates of what's out there because there's also uh, data out there right now looking at all the states, 
showing that death rates are up just in general above where we would normally be at this time of year. We also look at data about uh, movement of people. We track data on social distancing. And so things like traffic patterns and how much people are out and about. So there are a lot of different ways um, that scientists and others are trying to measure the impact of coronavirus. And I suspect there'll be more and more as time goes on. Thank you. Good afternoon, Ben Schwartz with WCPO in Cincinnati. Um, Governor DeWine, we've been hearing from a lot of local places like um, campgrounds and canoe rentals who say they've been planning to social distance for some time now and are very confident in their ability to properly social distance if they were to open up. Um, so I want to know if you have thought about any plans around campgrounds and rentals like that, if they are able to properly socially distance their customers, if they'd be able to open up soon. Yes, we're, we're going to certainly look at that. Uh, I, I think that uh, campgrounds, for example, uh, there's certainly uh, ways that people can do that. Uh, again, kind of get back to the basics of what, you, what we worry about. And we, what we worry about is groups coming together, particularly groups that are not, you know, not of the same family or, or as Dr. Atkins says, the same tribe. We all kind of have our own, you know, group, group, group of people. And when you go out of that, then you're introducing one group into the other. So I think what you worry about in campgrounds uh, is not people being in their trailer or, or, or their camper or, or their tent. Uh, but what you worry more about is, the, is common areas. And so figuring out how you can do that where you can still have a great camping experience. Fran and I have camped all across this country. We've camped a lot of places in Ohio. Um, it's something, it's a great thing to do with uh, your kids, with your grandkids. Um, and so figuring out how to, you know, how to do that in, in a way that is safe is, is certainly something that's, that's desirable and I'm sure something that we can, we can figure out working with the people who run run the campgrounds. Now, in addition to the private campgrounds, obviously you also have uh, the state campgrounds um, and, you know, our, our state parks uh, r remain open. Uh, I talked to Mary Mertz uh, a couple nights ago when I was out walking on my farm. I, I called her and said, how are things going, uh, you know, in the, in the state parks? Uh, one is closed just because of the, the, the great number of people who come there. Uh, and it was impossible to keep the social distancing. But the other ones, um, she says that the, the number of people coming to the state parks is, is significantly up. Uh, people who've never come to a state park before, and what we hope is that, uh, you know, even when the coronavirus is over, those folks will continue to come back to our state parks, because we have some state parks that are not utilized very much, uh, and they're great places to go and just get away, and it's, they're absolutely beautiful. So um, that's... We're talking about camping. I just thought I'd talk about a little bit about our state parks too. But uh, we're, we're going to work on that, Ben. And uh, you know, that's something that is, you know, we're working on this month. Thank you, Governor. Kevin Landers, WBNS 10 TV. My question is for the governor. Governor, uh, we've spent more than a billion dollars in unemployment. Uh, the lieutenant governor has said that the 1.7 billion, I believe, in the rainy day fund. We may need twice that to last the next 15 months. How close is the state towards bankruptcy? Well, the state has to balance its budget, as you know, by law. Uh, and so we will balance our budget because that's what uh, the law requires us to do. And, and some of us think that's a pr probably a good idea. That, State cannot print money. The federal government does print money. Uh, you know, they don't, they have, they can run a, a significant deficit and certainly do run a significant deficit. But we have to balance our, our accounts. And, uh, you know, we've already made cuts. Uh, we're going to have some announcements at the end of this week, by the way, uh, in regard to additional things that we're doing. We're consulting uh, with the four leaders of the legislature. Uh, minority and majority leaders, and we'll have some announcements later on. So uh, we will balance the budget. Uh, we'll we'll do what we need need to do. John, do you want to add some? I, no, oh, no, I'm sorry. I, no, Governor, I'm sorry. I th yep. th you covered it well. The state will balance its budget. We will get through this. Uh, it's just going to take time and and going to take collaboration. Yep. 
Jesse Balmer at the Cincinnati Inquirer for either the governor or Dr. Acton, or maybe both. I guess given what we know about lags in information about deaths and cases and so forth in the data, how will we know the effects of the manufacturing and office worker lifting on, by the time that we're lifting retail about a week later? I guess, do we have enough time to see the effects of these changes we're imposing? These are going to be layered in the ones we announced, but, but we're, you know, Dr. Acton has, has said, um, you know, and she can correct me here, which is fine. Uh, you know, we're talking about two to three weeks before you really start seeing anything. And so we're going to have to, obviously, we're going to be watching these things. Uh, and, you know, we know that as more people start coming together, even if they're doing it in a, in a very responsible way, that the spread does increase. And, and you know, we want to keep that to a minimum as much as we can. But, you know, we're going to be watching these numbers. And, uh, you know, we watch these numbers every single day. But you, as you point out, it takes a few weeks before you start seeing, seeing the, the results. Dr. Acton, you want to add something to that? No, I, I would agree. I think, um, you know, the incubation period is about two weeks on average. Um, and then you wait another week to see sort of how long it takes to collect the data and come back. So three weeks and two, six weeks and eight weeks out, I think, is when you start to see some of the changes. And depending on the number, once again, you might see cases early on um, if they're diagnosed um, with testing. And then you would see hospitalizations lag that by another almost two weeks and deaths lag about four weeks behind that. So it's always a sort of lag time, just do the long incubation period of this virus. And that's why it is so important. And I can tell you, you know, all over the country and all over the world, folks are talking a lot about what are the best metrics. You know, I keep talking about we're dialing the, the dimmer switch, we're not flipping the switch, you know, like we did on the way in. We're, we're kind of trying to do some things and we're always scaling it by best practices, as the Lieutenant Governor said, you, I cannot express to you enough how much goes into each of these policy decisions. But then we also are looking at a spectrum of layering from the lowest risk, the least of us getting around and mixing around, because we still really do want people to mostly stay very distanced and mostly stay at home or out in your yard or at a park where, you know, similar to what we've been doing. Um, but then you go from those sort of, you know, less of that to increasingly, um, you know, things where you have more and more contact. And so that's a, that's a strategy that we're doing um, all over the world. We're learning as we go. Um, we're watching what happens very closely. And we're looking at metrics, like I said, new metrics all, in, all the time. Um, and some very steady ones that are very classic, like cases and positivity rates and, um, you know, other things like hospitalizations, because we want to always keep an eye on capacity as well. Thank you. Hickey with Hannah News Service, and this question is for the governor. Yesterday, Speaker Householder gave a statement where he said Republican members felt disrespected, quote, that some of their ideas on small businesses hadn't been included in the state's plan. What are you, what's your reaction on that from the speaker? We've had a very, I've had a very good um, relationship with members of the General Assembly, Republicans, Democrats, House members, Senate members. Uh, I, I, I kind of joke, but it's not a joke. I think everyone's, every one of them has my cell phone number. Every one of them has my email. Um, I read their emails. I, I read the text that they send me or the phone calls uh, that I get. So it's, <clears throat> it's a very, very open uh, relationship. Uh, the problems that we uh, are encountering are, are problems that we seek the members of the General Assembly's help on. Uh, I've always said that uh, nobody knows uh, members, <coughs> excuse me, a member of the General Assembly's district better than the member does, or at least that's the way it's supposed to be, and I think that's the way it is. Uh, so we seek their help, uh, but, uh, you know, as we go through this and, and make these decisions, uh, I don't expect um, everyone to agree with every decision that we make, um, but I have the ultimate responsibility, um, you know, through the health department 
on issues of, issues of health, but we certainly are very open uh, to ideas, suggestions. Um, I had conversations today to, with both the Senate, Senate President, uh, with the Speaker. Uh, we talked about a number of different things, uh, talked about uh, you know where, where we're going to go forward. I've asked for their help in regard to the barbershops, salons, uh, putting a group together of, of, of people out there in the communities that are members <coughs> that members of the delegation uh, that they know. Um, so they're going to do that, and, and we're going to work on these problems together. Uh, we're going to work on the problem of the budget together that was mentioned a moment ago. Uh, very, very much something that we work together on, um, and. We're gonna we're gonna continue to work and and, and solve the problem. So. Hey there, everyone. This is Ori from Spectrum News One. Ori given Spectrum News One. I have a question around unemployment. It could be for the governor or lieutenant governor. Um, we've had a lot of viewers that have written in because they either have penalty weeks or they're in arrears for their unemployment. They're looking for some type of relief and they're wondering if there can be anything done so that they can get at least a partial payment. And then we have people still wondering about this new call center, whether it's up and why they're still getting delays on the phones. John, you want to go through the numbers on, on yeah, the call sure. center? Yeah, let me, sure. Let me go through the, the numbers today that I have. Um, uh, so far, 459,375 people have been uh, paid since this all started uh, basically on March the 15th. Uh, that total amount regarding the regular unemployment and the $600 bonus payments is $1,346,291,403.77. And uh, we have had, we are now up to 1,657 uh, employee, uh, employees answering calls and processing uh, at, the, uh, at the call center. Uh, they handled 54,000 calls yesterday and uh, the average wait time was 23 minutes. And we recognize that, that during certain times of day, especially uh, that's busier than others, uh, they've continued to build capacity. Uh, individuals who are um, eligible for the, 1090, the 1099 or the independently employed people, they can now go to the website and and begin the process of applying, although those benefits will not be, they will not be eligible for processing for another few weeks, probably around May the 15th. Uh, and as you can see, there's a lot of activity going on. Uh, they're processing and answering calls and, and solving problems as quickly as they can. Every time the question comes up, I will add that even if you haven't uh, been able to get through and get your eligibility established, you are eligible for the benefits from the very first day, so you will, they will be backdated. You will ultimately receive the, the, the money that you're eligible for. Uh, it's just in some circumstances, it's taking longer than others. If, for example, you have mismatched employer data, mismatched Social Security information, sometimes there are other questions that have to answer, and, and those things take longer. But that's the process. Uh, it, it is, uh, in, that's the, the most recent update that I can provide. Uh, we would, I would have to get uh, that information from Director Hall on the penalty weeks, and so we'll get that, we'll get that information uh, back to you. Hello, it's uh, Andrew Welsh Huggins with the Associated Press. Um, this is a general prisons question for the governor or Dr. Acton. Um, we're starting to see some numbers tick up at some other prisons. These are positive cases, I mean Belmont and uh, the Corrections Reception Center. And I'm wondering, uh, based on the experience at the other prisons, um, can we assume that probably most inmates at Ohio prisons now do have a positive test? And um, if so, especially with two employees now having died and 19 inmates having died, uh, is there anything more that can be done to um, protect employees and inmates in all the Ohio prisons? Uh, I, I think it would be a good 
good idea. Uh, we've been meaning to do this, and we have not done it. Uh, but to bring the director in, we'll Skype the director because uh, the director has been doing not only as the director, but uh, she's got a lot of help. Uh, been doing a lot of different things. We we we've surged in there with with a lot of tests. Um, we brought in the best experts that we can find, uh, and as far as the housing of, of the prisoners, um, you know, we have done, we're seeing the prison population uh, continue tomorrow. Uh, we do that once a week. Uh, so a lot of different things are going on. Dr. Acton, you want to take any of those? Yeah, I, I don't have any of the numbers with me, um, but we can certainly um, get that or from the director. Um, and I, I think... Um, I think it would be really good for everyone to hear from her because I, I, I can just say, um, having sat in on calls, having many members of my team be a part of this, uh, I've given her name to health directors all across the country because of the kind of work she is doing. So I, I, I think it would be wonderful to hear from her. I'll we'll give you a good, I think, a good comprehensive report when we do that. We'll try to do that in the next few days. Thank you. Hi, Governor. Andy Chow with Ohio Public Radio and Television State House News Bureau. Um, uh, on the issue of face masks and mandating face masks, I heard you talk about the, the, the reason why you wanted to change it for customers, but can you talk a little bit more about changing the mandatory face masks for employees and for workers? Oh, oh I'm sorry, for the, for the employees and the workers? Yeah, because um, they, yeah. they're no this, longer this is still uh, part of the order. Um, again, this was the request of business. Uh, many businesses have been doing this. Uh, we saw, for example, Kroger uh, a few days ago went to mandatory uh, for every every employee. So it, I think it's going to be fairly standard in, in, in the workplace. Um, there are some types of business that cannot comply with that. I know, John, you had a conversation uh, you might want to share with Andy and everyone. Yeah, uh, there, you know, there, we're going to come up with a, with a list of frequently asked questions on this because we know that it's, it's complicated. There are, for example, some in the food, food processing uh, uh, industry who are are not by FDA standards, as I understand it, as it was explained to me, allowed to wear cloth masks, and and so you know we're going to have circumstances where it's not going to be uh, either practical or allowed by other regulations, and so we're going to we're going to attempt to address those unique situations. And as I think, as the governor might have mentioned yesterday, if you're sitting alone in your office. Uh, it, it's, you know, we're not going to require people to wear a mask while they're sitting alone in their office. Um, but we will provide further guidance on this because I know I, I've talked to every industry group and there is many, when you, when you announce something, there are a lot of questions about these things. We're going to attempt to clarify them in a, an FAQ so that, so that we can give that specific guidance. But look, in every circumstance where it's feasible, masks need to be worn. I mean, again, Andy, the, the goal is to protect the employees. I mean, that's, that's it. Uh, good afternoon, Governor. Randy Ludlow with the Columbus Dispatch. Um, yesterday, masks were mandatory, uh, both in retail shopping and for employers. Today, they're not. Uh, you say they are a best practice. You highly recommend them. Uh, why back off that stance? What medical reason do you have for reversing that position? Well, that's a good that's a good question. I I, I thought I explained it a little bit, but let, let me let me try a, a, again. We have issued dozens and dozens, maybe hundreds of orders uh, throughout this period of time. Uh, yesterday, we made a lot of announcements. A lot of different things, um, and but I also uh, listen to what people say. And you know, I told you about the call I got from from the mom, uh, but that wasn't 
all of it. I, we heard from John and I heard, I heard uh, from a lot of different people who felt that I may wear a mask or I may not wear a mask, but the government should not be telling me wh what to do. And so we believe that in almost every case, uh, it is safer for everyone uh, if both people wear a mask. But we also know that this was offensive and, and, and it just, people looked at this and they said, that's, that's one government mandate too far. <laughs> it's just too much. And I'm not, I just, this is, this is, this is wrong. And so part of my job uh, is to lead Ohio through this the best I can. And the most important part of that is not what I do. Uh, but what the people of the state do. And it's important that people have confidence in me, have confidence in this administration, uh, think that what we're doing uh, and the things that we require them to do are reasonable, uh, and the things that we require them to, de to do are not too obnoxious to them. Uh, and this was one where some people uh, felt that it was just one step too far. Um, I believe that we're going to continue to talk about this, and it's my belief that the majority of Ohioans, when they go into a retail place, uh, will wear a face covering uh, because I think it's in their interest, and I think they also are going to find it's in the interest of people who are working there. Uh, so I think we're going to get most of it, um, but maybe, maybe not all of it, um, and that's why we made the decision. We got to continue the confidence uh, in, in people of the, of the state. John? Yeah, I would, also, I would also add that when we talked to some employers, they, they, they felt very good about the policy, and they felt very good about, about having to inform a customer that they need to do it, they felt very comfortable about how they would actually physically ask an employee to mandate it on somebody and, and some of the concerns around that. So we listen. We listen to people, uh, and, and I thought the governor articulated very well uh, about finding that balance. And then, and then lastly, on the unemployment compensation question regarding penalty weeks, that is a federal requirement that was not waived at the federal level. Well, we thank you all very much uh, and look forward to seeing everybody uh, tomorrow at, uh, oh, well, <laughs> I got cut off. I'm sorry. <laughs> I apologize. <laughs> we had one more question, but I, I was getting the, the hook here. So we'll, we'll start with you next time. Or you want to do it? Go ahead. Go ahead. Oh, of motor vehicles and libraries. What is the plan for that? All right, libraries and what? Bureau of Motor Vehicles. Bureau of Motor Vehicles. Yeah. Um, look, we'll talk with the, the director of Bureau of Motor Vehicles. Again, you know, we've stopped the requirements. Uh, we've kind of let people uh, go over time periods in the Bureau of Motor Vehicles. Uh, libraries, look, we all love libraries. Libra libraries are a, a, a great place. Uh, again, what we want to do is be able to have the information from libraries, but um, you know the gatherings of people together is is what the concern is, and we're still concerned about space. We're still concerned about gathering a lot of people together, and that is just uh, part part of part of the challenge. But we'll continue to look at things and evaluate things. Thank you. Thank you. See you all tomorrow, two o'clock. Thank you.